awesome. All right, let's talk about PhD programs. Let's jump right in. So through this part of the talk, um, I'm gonna talk first about what is a PhD? Um, those letters, uh, Doctor of Philosophy, what does that actually mean? Why would you wanna pursue a PhD? What are the differences in biomedical PhD program structures? One of the confusing things about PhD programs, if you've started to look into them, is that they're different at every institution you look at. So we'll talk about some of the terminology between different types of programs. Um, I'll talk about a few resources that are just phenomenal uh, ways to learn more about the PhD. And then I'll talk a little bit about Vanderbilt. So, um, of course, I want you to get to know Vandy. I think we have phenomenal PhD programs. I'm not just here to sell Vanderbilt, so, but I wanna add a little bit of the end. <laughs> okay, what is a PhD? And I have to admit, I don't think I really understood what a PhD was before I started my PhD. And it's really good to take a step back and understand what is the goal of this degree. So PhD, you've probably heard that is a doctor of philosophy. And this is really the highest degree that can be awarded from an institution. It is, uh, truly speaking, the most honorable academic degree that you could get. And philosophy, you might say, well, I don't care about philosophy. I don't wanna study philosophy, but I wanna get a PhD. Well, philosophy here, really, it's a historical term and it comes from the Latin philo, meaning friend or lover of, and Sophia, <laughs> wisdom. So really a, do a doctor of philosophy means that you love to, to learn more. You're a lover of wisdom. It's not philosophy in the, the academic sense that you're, you're used to thinking about studying. It's just more a doctor of learning more. How cool is that? Okay, so I want to distinguish, there are a few different types of doctorates, okay? So there's a research degree, a research doctorate, or a PhD as an example of that. And that's a degree where you're doing your own original research. And I'm going to talk more about what I mean by that. You're discovering new knowledge. You're creating new knowledge in a research degree. And that's compared with a professional degree. So MDs, which you'll hear all about on Wednesday. An MD, yes, it's a doctor degree. It's a medical doctor degree, but that's applying knowledge. So for example, an MD professional degree is applying the research that PhDs do to practical problems. So taking biomedical research and um, solving health issues. Um, and that, so it's more an application-based degree. So what does a PhD trainee do? <laughs> so I'm going to talk pretty theoretical um, at the beginning of this talk, and then I'm going to move more to tangible. What does the structure actually look like? What am I going to do in year one, year two, year three, et cetera? We'll get there. But broadly speaking, what a PhD trainee does is they analyze theories and concepts. So they really think about current theories and what's out there. They assess and identify gaps in knowledge. And by gaps in knowledge, what I mean is, what are the things we don't know? Uh, for example, we might know that polymerase is important in uh, RNA replication, but we might not know how it's regulated. So that's a gap in knowledge that we need to research to understand better. A PhD advances the body of knowledge in a field through research. Already said that, I'm gonna say that a lot today. <laughs> and then a PhD also communicates their work effectively. So a huge part of training is communicating your work both in written format and in oral format. And we'll talk a lot more about that. So, boil it down, what does a PhD really do? And the answer is research. <laughs> the big thing you're doing in this degree is biomedical research for a biomedical PhD. Yes, you're gonna learn some stuff and yes, you're gonna talk about your science and all of that. But the major thing a PhD does, most of their time is spent in the lab conducting research. So there are three main objectives for a PhD. 
One is, of course, to learn more about the current field. So yeah, there's some classwork and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, mostly years one and two is when you're taking additional classes beyond your bachelor's degree. The second is to perform research, as I said, and that's really gonna happen a little bit in year one, but mostly starting year two and five, that's when you'll be doing your dissertation research under uh, in somebody's lab. And then the third part is disseminating your dissertation, disseminating your knowledge. And that can kind of happen in years three through five, writing publications, giving talks. Down here, I have a picture of a poster symposium. Um, you might give oral talks. Defending your dissertation is the culmination, the milestone of your degree. So as you can see, there's kind of uh, overlapping objectives that you pursue throughout your degree, starting first with learning more, extending towards discovering more knowledge, and then finally finishing up with uh, disseminating that information. Before I dive into this a little bit more, I want to get out some practical information that I get questions about all the time. So that this hopefully, ling if you have some lingering questions or some uh, misinformation sometimes about a PhD, you can know this upfront. First of all, to pursue a PhD, it doesn't require that you have a master's. So most people who start a PhD don't have a master's. Some do, and maybe a master's might be helpful, might help you in the admission side of things. We'll talk about that at the end of <laughs> the end of our series here. But you know, it's uh, almost never the case that people have a master's before a PhD. Another fun fact, most STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, PhDs require or provide a stipend, not require a stipend, provide a stipend, give you, they pay you, you get paid to pursue a PhD. And it's, it's a living wage for us. Our stipend is a little bit above 30,000 right now. Um, and we cover tuition. So sometimes I hear people say they don't want to pursue a PhD because they don't want to go into more debt. Well, you won't. Um, you, of course, you might have some debt from undergrad and you can you know, forego paying off those loans while you're pursuing a PhD. Um, you don't have to pay them while you're pursuing that PhD, but you're also not going into further debt. You're actually getting paid. Um, and this funding comes from institutional funding. So Vanderbilt provides some funding, um, some grants. So faculty, if you're working in a faculty member's lab, they'll pay you to work for them. And then fellowships, you can, you can write and get your own funding. Now for most programs, you don't have to get your own funding. They'll guarantee the funding for you. So it's kind of a good deal if you're interested in research and you really want to pursue knowledge consider a PhD. Can I just, I'm sorry, real fast, Please. Dr. Bowman. Um, I just wanted to say, you might've heard also um, some PhDs do require you to pay tuition um, for the arts and humanities, you usually have to pay, but for STEM fields, you don't have to. So that's where some of this miscommunication comes from. Excellent, thank you, yes. Okay, so there's really, not a structured timeline for a PhD program. As compared to a professional degree, so an MD, they'll talk about the structure of what year, exactly what year one looks like in two and three and four, and it's very detailed and very specific about what you'll be doing each month. That's not quite the case for a PhD. And a PhD, because you're getting new knowledge and the culminating thing with a PhD is disseminating your dissertation information, PhD kind of takes as long as it takes to get there, <laughs> to get that information. And, um, you know, I've seen people take four years. I've seen people take six years. Uh, it really varies. And there's a, sometimes what takes, can might take some time is that life happens, you know? So um, this is a really key part of your um, maturity uh, and your early to mid 20s, early to mid to late 20s. Um, so, you know, because there's not a structured timeline that actually gives some flexibility for, for life. 
one other piece of information. So PhD can take a while, but if, if you're interested in pursuing a traditional path, which I'll talk about in a little bit, there's some additional training after a PhD. And this is called a postdoctoral fellowship. If you're in a lab, you might have seen some people in the lab called, call themselves postdocs. Um, I had no idea what a postdoc was until I was in my PhD. And this is a training beyond the PhD. This might be two years, might be four years, might be five years um, to get some more independent research experience before pursuing your own lab. And then I, I just wanna uh, sometimes uh, when talking about a, a PhD or talking about biomedical research, there's some terms that are kind of thrown around interchangeably. So the head of a lab, the boss, the person who runs the lab who you're working for might be referred to as your mentor because they're mentoring you through your PhD. They sometimes are also referred to as a PI. Now that's not private investigator, that's principal, inve principal investigator. And this is the person who has the grants to pursue the research. They write and get the money to pursue the research. So if you hear me talk about the word mentor or PI or head or boss, <laughs> that's all referring to the same thing. Okay, so why would someone pursue a PhD? Gosh, there are lots of reasons someone would pursue a PhD. Ask yourself a couple of things. Do you like asking questions or dissecting information? I'll tell you what, when I was an undergrad, one of my favorite things to do was to take uh, the schematics found in a textbook and fiddle with it in my mind. Think about what would happen if I took out this or what would happen if I took out that um, and just kind of played with it. I wasn't, I didn't enjoy learning just to memorize facts. I really wanted to get in there and think about the mechanics of what's going on in organic chemistry, visualizing the experiment, the um, different reactions of what might happen. If you like really thinking through and wrestling with the content you're learning, you might wanna pursue a PhD. If you like discovering things, if you're someone who as a kid, if you like to go out in the yard and play with the bugs and play with the, uh, with the uh, flowers and leaves, you like discovering new things. If you like to solve problems, that's a huge reason why someone would be interested in a PhD. A lot of what you're doing is coming up with the experiments that you would uh, design to answer important questions. That's problem solving. I tend to think that a PhD kind of falls along two spectrums. They either really love discovery or they really love problem solving or they really love both. I have yet to find somebody who's in a PhD who doesn't fall into one of those bins. Those are the big drivers for really enjoying research. Of course, PhD, you learn to communicate. We'll talk about that. Do you wanna be a better communicator? You'll get that in a PhD. Or do you wanna gain the skills to aid in a career in science? Now that career that you're interested in might not involve research and that's okay. You don't have to want to do research 10 years from now to pursue a PhD. Now, with that said, there's so many reasons to get a PhD, and, but you have to enjoy doing research now. It's okay if you think that your career 10 years from now is not going to be research. Say you're interested in science advocacy or teaching um, without, without doing a lot of research, or if you're interested in science writing. You might not want to do research in the long run, but you got to like research enough to pursue a PhD. You have to actually really enjoy pipetting and coming up with new information, solving new problems. There's some not so good reasons to pursue a PhD. And I, you know, I, just to be straightforward, please don't pursue a PhD for the title because it's a difficult process. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about that. It's a long process. And if you just wanna be called Dr. So-and-so, this might not be the best way to do that. Honestly, I'm not sure that any doctorate is the right path for you if you just wanna be called Dr. So-and-so. Money is not a great reason to pursue a PhD. There are um, so many wonderful careers that we'll talk about for people who have a PhD. PhDs uh, generally are very stable 
career-wise, but they're not the big money makers, to be honest. And you know, there's some careers that people pursue that do make a lot of money, but on the spectrum, this is gonna get you a little more financial um, security than not having a PhD, but you're not gonna be highly wealthy probably. <laughs> Just a side um, note, I'm sorry. Um, so, so though a career in science with a PhD versus a career in science without a PhD, there is a stark contrast. So true. if you do want a career in science, say you want to join a pharmaceutical industry one day, the PhD is going to give you a big bump that's really good. Yeah. A, a big bump, but don't do this just for the big bump. <laughs> All right. Don't do this if other people are pressuring you to get a PhD. Honestly, this is your life. And you know your family might want to pressure you to get a, a doctoral degree. And, and I understand that. But don't do it because of that. And then, of course, um, I've seen cases where people really want to go to medical school. And they don't do well in the MCAT. And then they decide that they'll get a PhD instead. That's wonderful if in the process you've discovered you enjoy research and if you enjoy discovering things and you enjoy problem solving, that is totally fine. If you don't like those things and you just want an alternative to med school, a PhD is not at all like medical school. It is just very, very different. You're not treating patients. You're, you're not in the clinic. You're doing research at the bench. Yes, you're working in a team, but it's, it's a very different path. So don't do this just as an alternative. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the traditional path versus kind of the current today path and what that looks like. And I want to make this distinction because I've seen a lot of advising that might suggest that you're hearing about traditional paths and not what actually happens today. So back in the day, <laughs> like 30 years ago, um, what a PhD used to look like is you would apply directly to a faculty member's lab. You'd have to know exactly the type of research you wanted to do. You'd have to think about exactly who you want to work with. You'd have to really nail down exactly what you're passionate about. And you'd apply to that member's lab. Then you do your research. And then you do a, that postdoctoral fellowship and pursue a faculty position. Now, whether that's more a, a teaching faculty position or a research faculty position, or maybe do, re, do industry, that was really it. It was a little bit more like a pipeline and there was uh, not a lot of choice involved in it. Today, it is so different and I'm thrilled about it. So the word for today's path is choice. The first is you apply to programs and in most biomedical PhD programs, you have the opportunity to test out different labs, to find the lab that fits you best. That's called rotating. You get to rotate in different labs. Now, for some programs, you might get to rotate in two labs, and some programs you might get to rotate in four labs. There are different numbers depending on the program you're looking in, and the breadth of research, the different types of research labs you can look in, vary depending on the program you, you talk about. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later. So then after you test out the labs and you're there in person, then you do your dissertation research and then maybe do a postdoctoral fellowship. So these days, only about 70% of, of students will go on to do a postdoc. It's becoming less common that everybody follows that, that traditional path of PhD postdoc career. Sometimes people go directly from their PhD to their career. And then the other thing about careers is that there are so many diverse types of careers that PhDs will go on to do. To be honest, I don't even know all of them because it is such an individual process how people pursue the career they're interested in. So the word is, or the phrase is that it's not just faculty anymore. And even when I started my PhD, it used to be thought of as you pursue a faculty career or an alternative career. And we don't like that phrase alternative career because it's not true that that's kind of like 
less than attractive, less than a faculty position. It's not unattractive. If anything, it gives you the ability to really find your own passion. So even that phrase alternative is, is out of style because it just kind of doesn't fit with what is common today. So PhDs have diverse careers. And actually these days, 75% of people with a PhD go on to pursue something other than a faculty position. So the overwhelming majority of PhD graduates are not in faculty positions. They found something else that they're passionate about. Now, whether that be government administration or nonprofit management or science outreach or uh, patent law, journalism, gosh, you could go on to do a lot of different things. So here's kind of a, a really quick snapshot, and this is a very busy slide on purpose. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of what our graduates have gone on to do. So in red, this red section here are kind of the traditional faculty positions. So people on the tenure track or who are tenure, tenured or even non-tenure track faculty, We've got a lot of people who go into industry. So some who are in research positions who are actually you know, still pipetting at the bench. Some who are more in manage, the management or administrative side of industry. We've got people who work in government, nonprofit, K-12 education and science outreach. Um, we've got uh, intellectual property law. Some people will go on to med school after the PhD, 2%, that's crazy, that's awesome. Um, and then, you know, some people are pursuing such a diverse career that we can't really map them on this map. So there are so many opportunities for what you could do with a PhD. And this sounds all well and good, but actually that kind of makes it hard, right? You, you, it's hard to know all, what all of the options are. And so one thing you do during your PhD is think about your career development. And I'll talk about that towards the end. Okay, so why should someone get a PhD? Hey Beth, Please. we have a great question in chat. Oh. oh, oh, it was sent to me. Oh, great. So somebody said, um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> would you say that some PhD students go on to pursue something other than a faculty position due to choice or more due to a lack of faculty of, um, positions being available? That is competition. a excellent question. I really like that question. That is such a good question. So the point is that there aren't a lot of, there, there, not a lot of people go on to pursue a faculty position. And so the question is, do they um, pursue something different because of the competition or do they pursue something different because they find what they're passionate about? The way that I see it, I've seen a lot of people go through this process. And I think the narrative today is that people pursue something else because of the competition. But in reality, that's not what I see with our graduates. I see them pursue something else because they discover something else they're passionate about. They discover a different angle of their interests or they discover um, a whole new field, a whole new way to apply that PhD that they didn't even know existed. So I'm not, I, I do think that perhaps the competition might spur their imagination and what they're interested in, <laughs> but I don't think that they end up in a less satisfying career. I think they end up in very, actually perhaps careers that are even more tailored to what they're interested in doing. That's my genuine answer. And I, I, I do think part of the, um, part of the challenge is well, to put it blunt, I think in academia, the faculty position is held up on a pedestal as being important and being the most sought after thing that you should seek. And that's because the people that you're talking to in academia are faculty members. So of course, they're gonna wanna really value their own career choices. And of course they pursued a career they're really interested in but they don't know other paths. That's why you should go to a school that have career counselors to really talk through this, that understand what that, what that um, landscape looks like. So um, the narrative is that it's competition because the people making the narrative are the ones who are in academia. So it's a little 
uh, chicken and egg there. Okay, so there's so many reasons to get a, a PhD. You have to enjoy research. But the point is, it's okay to have a lot of different interests because there are a lot of different careers that you can pursue with a PhD. So let's talk a little bit about different program structures. Okay, so you're used to um, probably thinking about the undergraduate level where you've got a lot of class and a little bit of lab work. In grad school, it's completely different. There's a little bit of class and a lot of lab work. The majority of your time is spent in the lab. So again, we have these three main objectives that I'm gonna talk through again. The first is learning about the current field. So you do that, yes, with classes. And you've been doing that, right? At the undergraduate level, you've been learning about the current field. That's the point. Um, but in grad school, we lean on a lot of other new ways to really teach you what's what the current field looks like. Yes, there are classes, but you also lean on the primary literature a lot more. You read a lot more papers. Hopefully you're starting to get a sense of reading the, reading the literature as an undergrad now, but you'll do that more. You also gather preliminary data. Um, that's a way to really uh, reinforce some of that um, those uh, current theories that are present. The second, as I said, is performing research. So we do that in a couple of in a couple of ways. Of course, we actually do the research, but then you have to in your PhD you have to defend a research proposal. You have to stand in front of a, a, a team of faculty members, about five faculty members, and defend what your question is. Defend how you're going to address the question. This is often called a qualifying exam. It's an oral uh, examination um, where there's no real structure. They'll just ask questions that are relevant and interesting and uh, wanna see how you think. Yeah, it's a little intimidating, um, but it, to be honest, it's the qualifying exam is one of the best ways to really understand if you're starting to think like a scientist because that's the goal. We, they don't want you to just regurgitate in information. They want you to be thoughtful about it. And then disseminating the dissertation is the third uh, important part. So of course that comes with publishing papers, which you'll start doing as soon as you get enough data to make a story, talking at conferences, so much fun, and defending the dissertation. So oftentimes a PhD is broken down into kind of two sections. There's early career stage graduate students and late career stage graduate students. Early career stage graduate students are still taking classes, might be doing lab rotations and um, are pursuing the qualifying exam. Once you take, once you pass that qualifying exam, then you're really pursuing research. And that's the majority of what you do there. Okay, and the, everything culminates in your oral defense. So another way to look at this at the undergraduate uh, level, you're used to taking about four classes a semester every semester for four years. In grad school, it looks very different. You might take a couple of classes and, and um, they might be intense classes, don't get me wrong. They might take a lot of effort to, to do well, but you're not gonna be taking four or five classes a semester. You'll take a couple. Um, and you only do that through your second year, generally speaking. And then at the end of your second year, that's when you take your qualifying exam and really dive into doing research. So after that, it's kind of, it's like an intense, but a full-time job doing research, working at the bench, not to uh, undermine the importance of how difficult it is. It is, it can be challenging to uh, understand or to pursue an independent research project that nobody's done before. So because of those diverse careers that are now available, um, kind of within the last five or 10 years, a huge part of um, years three through five is starting to become career planning. Rather than having you figure it out alone, a lot of graduate programs include that now in the formal part of your career, your graduate career. And then at the end is your defense. Let's see a question. Are there more testing or larger exams after year two? This is a great question. You know what? The answer is no. Once you're done with your qualifying exam, 
you'll have what are called committee meetings. So you'll get together with a group of fa faculty that are really guiding you through your, your dissertation. And you'll meet with them every six to 12 months. It kind of varies depending on the program, but they're not there to grill you like they are in the qualifying exam. <laughs> they're there to help guide you and to help answer questions and to help make sure that you're making good progress on your project. Great question. Good question here. What happens if a student fails the qualifying exam? That's an excellent question. I'm kind of, yeah, a lot is really like hinged on that qualifying exam. It's an important thing and it can be, um, it, it's an important exam. Um, Almost everywhere, if you fail your qualifying exam, you have a second opportunity to take it. And from my experience, I've, I've seen a lot of graduate students pursue this. Everybody who wants to continue in their PhD knows better how to prepare for the, for the retake. And they, they do well in the second time. There are some people, to be honest, who after not doing well in their first time, they, they really question if this is really what they want. I have not seen a situation where someone fails a qualifying exam and is asked to leave a program if they want to continue in the program and if they're putting in the effort. Sometimes people are, are not, don't stay in the program because they ultimately realize this isn't what they wanna do. And so they, they decide that they wanna pursue something else. But to answer the question, you fail it once, you can take it again. Uh, someone asked a question, does failing the qualifying exam add time to complete the PhD? That is an excellent question that I have never uh, quantitatively tried to answer, that I'm gonna actually go in and try to quantitatively answer that. My guess would be no, because yes, you have to prepare for the qualifying exam the second time, but you're also doing research along those lines, along that timeline. So you're not just studying in preparation for your second exam. You're, you're doing research along the line too. Great question. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Someone asked a really good question. Can I give more details about what the qualifying exam entails? That is an excellent question. I am being a little bit fuzzy about that. So I will say that the qualifying exam, or it might be called a candidacy exam, it depends on you know, what program you're in, it's all the same kind of thing. It looks a little bit different depending on the program you're in, but generally speaking, what you do is you give a short presentation about your, um, your proposal for what your uh, dissertation project is going to look like. And Throughout that presentation, a committee of about five faculty members can ask you questions <laughs> and honestly interrupt your presentation and really kind of dig at your understanding of what, you're, of what you might know. So when you talk about, you, you'll talk a little bit about the background of what you're doing, and then you'll talk about your experimental approaches for how you're going to answer your question. And they'll... Um, they'll just ask you questions. So honestly, it's really just being, it's you standing in a panel of faculty and you're being asked questions and you're supposed to try to answer them to the best of your ability. To be honest, they push you to the extent of your knowledge. They intentionally get you all the way up to your, the extent of your knowledge and see how you think when they push you past that. When they at, they'll ask you something that they know you don't know and you're just supposed to use your, your understanding of the field to think about how would you answer their question? What do you think is going on there? And um, it's really a, a test on how you think. So it usually lasts about a couple hours, hour and a half, two hours, an oral exam. Great just question. so you know, it's it's also not standardized. Like like in med school, they have like step one, step two tests that are standardized across all medical students. This is completely not standardized. It, it, the questions are based on the committee you happen to have, um, very personalized. Mm -hmm. And what your project is. It depends on what your project is. So yes. Um, is the defense the same format 
No, you know, to be honest, the defense is significantly easier if I'm being straightforward. So your committee, um, so I mentioned you have committee meetings after your qualifying exam. Your committee won't let you schedule your defense unless they think you're ready for it. So unless you have enough research or unless you can communicate your science well enough, they're not gonna let you schedule your defense. And there are two parts of a defense. The first part is an hour, hour long presentation where you talk about all of the research that you did throughout your graduate career. And then after that hour long presentation is uh, another about an hour, it depends, hour, hour and a half discussion uh, about your work. And generally speaking, they might ask you questions and they want you to, you should be thoughtful about your answers. This is, it is still a defense, right? Um, but, but they'll also kind of talk to you about your future and what you're looking forward to and, and a little bit more bigger picture. Um, they wouldn't let you defend if you weren't ready. Great questions. All right, someone said, could I post that quantitative answer about uh, the qualifying exam if it takes longer? I'll, I'll dig in and see if I can get a quick answer to that. And, and I'll try to answer that at the next meeting. All right, awesome questions. Okay, program structures. Okay, at research intensive institutions, there are a lot of biology focused departments. So if you're from a smaller undergraduate institution, you might only have department of biology and that's kind of the biology department. At bigger institutions, there are more departments that are more specialized. So you might have a chemistry department, a biology department, but then also a cancer biology, a cell biology or microbiology department. Graduate programs traditionally back in the day were structured around those departments. So there was a microbiology PhD program that was centered on the department of microbiology or cell biology that was centered on the de department of cell biology. So traditionally there are departmental based graduate programs. Over the years, this has changed a little bit. So rather than having, uh, for example, in this fake institution, five different <laughs> uh, graduate programs, um, there are kind of uh, more modern setups for graduate programs. There are either interdepartmental graduate programs. So interdepartmental means uh, programs that spread across a few departments. So here like biochemistry might spread across the department of chemistry and biology. Cancer cell biology might spread across cancer and cell biology or micro might be just a micro. An umbrella graduate program, program, you might've heard of an umbrella graduate program, this will encompass a lot of departments. So it is, it is interdepartmental, but it'll, it'll encompass more than just a couple. So an umbrella graduate program at some institutions will cover all of the biology and biomedical departments. And by covering that, what I mean is, you don't apply to a specific focused graduate program. So at schools that have umbrella graduate programs, you wouldn't apply to their cancer biology program. You'd apply to this umbrella graduate program and then have the ability to rotate in labs that are across all of these departments, okay? So that's a huge benefit of an umbrella program or an interdepartmental program is it gives you a broader scope of the faculty that you could look at in pursuing your research and pursuing your rotations. And a lot of the reason why this has kind of transformed this way is that sometimes there's not a distinction between the research going on in departments, right? So if there's a department of cell biology and the department of cancer biology, well, there might be faculty in the cell biology department that are doing cancer research. So to have a departmental based program might mean you are missing out on faculty that are in a different department. So umbrella program gives you the most flexibility and also really is kind of representative of the fact that there are not clear distinctions between these areas of biology anymore. Generally speaking, cell molecular biology is cell molecular biology, whether you apply it to immunology, neuroscience, cancer biology, it's all kind of 
generally the same technique wise. Okay, some resources. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about VND. Um, there's so many great opportunities to, to really learn about uh, graduate school um, online. So the first, I'll put a little shameless plug is I have a blog <laughs> that, I, that I write called Materials and Methods. If you've read a paper, do you get it? Materials and Methods, it's how you get, how you prepare for graduate school. So this is really an admissions blog. It's really to help you figure out how to, to be successful in applying to graduate programs, what graduate programs are looking for. Check it out. If you just Google Materials and Methods, Beth blog, you'll find it. There's a branch uh, of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, um, called OITE, Office of Intramural Training something, experiment. Um, and this has a lot of uh, great resources. Uh, I'll post this for you to, to link to. Um, there's some really great resources here for, oops, um, for, um, how to apply to graduate schools as well. The AAMC is traditionally known as being a resource for pre-meds, but it's growing. I'm actually serving on a committee for helping people who are interested in pursuing a PhD. They're growing that side of their resources as well. And then if you listen to podcasts, if you're pipetting in the lab for the summer, you should start listening to podcasts if you don't already. And there are two really great ones you should check out. The first is called the Hello PhD podcast by my friend at um, UNC, University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And it talks a lot about just living in a PhD and what that actually looks like. I'd say the earlier episodes are, are more appropriate for trainees at this phase. And then the Beyond the Lab podcast, if you're interested in thinking about careers in biomedical, uh, the biomedical sphere beyond the traditional faculty career, this really dives into specific careers and talks about people in those careers for you to think about what it's like to, to live there. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead and give a very quick <laughs> plug for Vanderbilt since we only have five minutes left. This is wonderful. I'm gonna actually be much faster than I, than I thought I would be. So we have two umbrella graduate programs here at Vanderbilt. Um, and by umbrella, I mean, we co it covers all of our biomedical PhD areas. The first is called the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program or IGP. And this is for graduate training in all of the biological or biomedical sciences. Really quickly speaking, I didn't know the difference between biological or biomedical when I was an undergrad. Really, biomedical means more applied to medicine, more applied to human health. So those terms can kind of be changed and it can be used interchangeably. But if you're studying something that's really relevant to human health, um, then you might call your work more biomedical, then biological might be a little more fundamental work. So like chemical biology, biochemistry, that kind of thing, or even chemistry. Uh, or um, uh, I did say chemical biology, never mind. Um, so we have umbrella department, uh, it's 11 departments and programs that our umbrella program covers. Um, and our philosophy, the reason we have such a broad umbrella program across all of our areas is number one, there are no boundaries anymore between these disciplines. And number two, we think that it's most important for you to find the perfect mentor first and then join the, the program second. So you'll do rotations in your first year and then enter into one of these specific more departmental based programs after that. So um, we have coursework your first year and we have four required rotations. And again, we have four because we think it's very important for you to test the waters. Experiment, you're a scientist, test it out, find the lab that fits you. I'm gonna, oh, oh, oh. Vanderbilt is a very collaborative, supportive and innovative institution. So of course we do phenomenal science. We are a top ranked biomedical research institution, but we're also friendly and we help each other. And we think that rather than competing to try to do the best science, we think that working together helps you do the best science. 
And anybody who doesn't agree with that, well, we don't want them at Vanderbilt. We're a very collaborative place. I'm going to jump ahead and say that we also have a really great program called the Quantitative and Chemical Biology Program. It's structured very similarly to the IGP program, but this is for students who come from other STEM backgrounds. So chemistry, physics, engineering, computer science, math. If you have one of those backgrounds and you don't have a lot of biology and you really wanna apply your skills to a biologically meaningful question, QCD is the perfect program for you. So we don't expect you to really know any biology at all. We'll teach it to you. We think that training at the interface of these disciplines is uh, really, you bring a unique skill set with that training. And I'm going to jump ahead, say we have phenomenal support outside of the lab. We have a program called the Initiative for Maximizing Student Diversity. We have a nationally recognized Office of Career Development. I've talked a lot about the importance of career development today. We have one of the first offices of career devel development formed in the country. Um, we are, we're a center for career development, nationally speaking, for many years. Um, we're really fantastic. We've got great core facilities for your research. We have a certificate program in molecular medicine if you want to do translational research. We also have a great center for teaching if you're interested in teaching, a great science outreach program, and many, many more opportunities. Nashville is a great place to be. I will not bore you with any more shameless plugs other than to say Music City, great economy, great living, a very affordable to live here, great outdoor living, great indoor living um, and sports. And we're friendly. Okay. There's my contact information. I really want to respect your time, but I'm going to stick around if anybody has any questions at all. If you want to get a sense of life of a, of a grad student, got a Twitter for that. So follow at Biomed Vandy. We have students take over and show you their day. So you can really see what it looks like to live in that life. Um, it's so much fun. I love doing it. I love seeing what they're like. So we've got awesome students. Check out our website to find recordings of all of our videos. We'll get them posted about a week after each of the presentations. We can't wait to see you.